Good morning, everybody. So great to see you. If you all could come. And uh, we are just welcoming our Bridge family that's here today. I also want to welcome our Bridge family that is online with us. Good morning to you. We're glad that you're with us. Here we go, everybody. You need to stand up. We got something to sing. Let's go for it. Amen. You're going to like this. Hang on just a second. We're going to hang on just a second, though, because there are great things happening. Is there still great things happening? Okay. It's a surprise. I am even surprised. Isn't that great? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Here we go. <laughs> me now. God. tell you what, we are so grateful to live in this beautiful land and all the people, men and women and families that contributed to that. Freedom, it's a big deal. It's a big deal and it will never be taken lightly and we will never forget those things that made us who we are today that's inside of every single one of us. So on that note, how about go find a new friend and uh, let's visit a little bit and we'll meet you back in a minute. Thanks y'all. Good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all at the Bridge Church today. You can find your seat somewhere. And all the people that did not leave the... Oh, okay, I'll wait till they finish talking, right? Oh, I know they do. The, uh, you may be seated this morning. I was going to poke at y'all a little bit, a little fun. How many of you understand that a real joke has to have some truth in it, right? And uh, the truth is, is some of you didn't leave your seat, and uh, you need to do better at going meeting new people in your church, okay? I say that in love, but that's the real truth, all right? How's everybody doing today? 
good, good. Thank God for the rain. Amen. Yes. Woohoo! Hallelujah. Well, at least I'm excited about it, right? It. Uh, thank you, David. The I forgot to grab my mic this morning, but I have a backup. Amen. I just have to keep Kelly away from it, right? And. Uh, amen. The uh, so good to see everybody. If you are a guest today at the bridge. Uh, like to say welcome to the Bridge Church. We're glad you're here. Uh, in the seat back in front of you, we have a tithing envelope. And inside there, you can put a little information so we can know a little bit about you. We're not going to bombard you or come to your house or anything like that without invitation. If you're a good cook, talk to my wife, right? No, she's a great cook. I didn't mean it that way, right? And uh, so it... Uh, Oh, I have lunch taken care of already. The, uh, you do that before Sunday. So if you're a guest today, please let us know you're here and you're attending service with us in this great and wonderful atmosphere. Amen? Right. Kelly? Thank you, Pastor. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, Kelvin, for having that amazing word last week, guys. We want to thank him for what he did. Y'all, that takes, number one, a lot of people are afraid to talk to people on a microphone, but he did a great job, and we're so proud of you. I just wanted to mention, if you happen to be uh, celebrating the 4th with your family, which is awesome, um, but we have these uh, bottles back over here on this table, and let me tell you how it works. They're kind of like a piggy bank, but they're a bottle bank. Yes, I came up with that myself. Um, well, not totally, but what I just said. Anyway, so what I wanted you to know is that what you do is you keep it like wherever you keep your spare change at your house. We have several places for spare change by the dryer. But anyway, um, and what you do is as you get your spare change, you just fill this puppy up. And then whenever it comes time, because we're going to do this for a while, then you bring your bottle that is full of your spare change. And if you want, I have a great idea that you're gonna love. Tell your grandchildren and your children, hey, I think there's money in the couch. Go see if you can find it. They do it for you. It is the greatest thing. So that is your tip of the day for the bottle bank. But I just wanted to mention that these are available for you to take home and use as a bank because this is really important. And uh, if you missed last Sunday, you might want to go back and listen to that because Kelvin went in detail to tell you all about that. And that was great. So awesome on that. Also, we have something really neat. It goes right along with our outside the walls. Um, it's a clothing drive. Everyone say clothing drive. I know we haven't done this before, but it's a great idea. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to go through the closets. Now is the time. Don't say later because later never comes. I'm speaking to me now. Um, but what you're going to do is you're going to go through all of the things, and here's the rule that I use. You can adopt it if you want to. If I have not wore this in the last six weeks, it depends on the certain flavor of the, of the outfit, but if I have not wore this, then it's time to go. Everybody give me an amen. I know. I'm wealth of information today. So what you're going to do is you're just going to put it in. A, you can put it in a garbage bag, a box, whatever you want. Just keep it and put it next to the door. So next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday, when you come to church, bring your clothes that you haven't worn in the last six weeks and bring the one, make sure they don't have holes and things like that, but just bring your clothes to the church and we're going to go through them. And then on another day, we are going to provide, it'll be the 22nd, we are going to provide an opportunity for families that need clothes and just in time for school. That's a good idea. Okay, so if they need clothes, they can come and they can just pick out their clothes. Isn't that great? That's a great idea. So thanks, you guys. That's part of everybody being a part of Outside the Wall. And I love that. Love that. So, okay, that's what I was going to tell you this morning. So if you want, I'd love for everybody to stand up. And uh, we're just going to go before the Lord. Father God, thank you so much. What an opportunity. 
What an opportunity for worship today. I was learning a little bit about worship, Lord. And just like kingship is the place of a king, worship is putting worth to you in your place. We choose to worship you because you are worthy in the place of worth and value and honor. So when we worship, Lord, we are recognizing the priority that you place or that we place you in our hearts and in our lives. And this is just our, this is our moment. This is our opportunity to take our thinking and our meaning in our heart and express it to you. So Father God, we just give you this time. Bless it. Bless your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. Here we go.
You are so good to me. I am just overwhelmed. The Lord gave me a word for this year. And who knew they had a song with it? It was grateful. And I thought after my parents had their health fiasco, I am grateful. And my daughter and my awesome son-in-law, grandpup, they're coming home. I am grateful. And then my husband has this terrible rollover trash the truck accident and ha doesn't even have seatbelt bruises. And I am so grateful. But you know what? I'm grateful for my church and my family and the support. You wouldn't believe the support, support coming from the back of behind me here and behind me over there, in front of me over there. Anyway, they're behind me even though they're in front of me. Figure that out. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for my family. I'm so grateful for the everyday little teeny tiny things, you know? How many times do we just get in such a hurry because we're busy and we're all busy and we forget our grateful? Let's not forget our grateful today, the little things and the big things. I am so grateful. Here we go. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express my gratitude? I can sing these songs as I often do, but every song I stand and you. all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. Come on, y'all. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all Get up and praise the Lord. 
up to the Lord this morning and just tell him how much you need him today tell him how great he is he is your God and just tell him Lord you are great and greatly to be praised hallelujah he's a good good father amen oh yes the greatness of God in the land of the living he's a great and mighty God in the earth today Hallelujah, God. Father God, we give you praise, honor, and glory, Lord. Hallelujah.
just lift your hands up and just minister to him for a moment. He needs to know that you rely upon him. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for living among us. Thank you for living with us. Thank you for setting up camp, angels encamped around us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I thank you that your report, God, is not the report of the world. Oh, God, you know every minute detail of every person walking on this earth. You know the future from the past. And right now you're in this room in our present, God. And we worship you today. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated today. It's so good to see everybody in church today. Those of you who are online today, we bless you also. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offering today. Can we give joyfully unto the Lord? Can you clap with me? Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord loves you today. Amen. Amen. I'd like to read a scripture to you. Before I do, I want to give you a little bit of background without teaching on it. But in the Philippian church, in their relationship with the Apostle Paul, the book of Philippians we read is written by Paul but in their relationship as an apostle and as a group, a church group, they had made a commitment to support his ministry financially, and they made that happen. And he writes back to them this verse by saying he made, they made that happen. Paul never came back by there to get any money, but they would send people to bring him the money they had promised. How many of you had to drive somewhere to keep your word like that. Come on. I said I wouldn't preach, right? But verse 19, Paul writes this to them, and he says, and my God shall supply. Everybody say supply. supply. All your need. How does he do that? According to his riches. Amen? That's why we walk on this earth, but Jesus, the bridge, connects us to the Father. Amen? according to his riches in glory, amen, amen, by Christ Jesus. Jesus did everything that needs to be done for you to be taken care of. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. 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 There are, thank you, uh, several different ways you can give at the bridge. One is this is a mailer envelope. Number two, you can go to our website, thebridgefs.com. You can also use on a smartphone you can, or a computer, you can use the Tithely app. You can drop off your offerings, tithes and offerings, at the office door, which is the last one on the north end of the building. There's a mail slot. Drop it in, and we'll take care of it. Amen? Are you excited to give to the Lord today? Are you thankful for the way the Lord has blessed you, increased in your life, and done great and wonderful things not only what God has done, but what he's going to do. He promised, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough trouble, but I got it all handled. Right? Amen. Think about that promise. God's got it all worked out already. Ready. So if you run into some trouble today, just grin a little bit. Praise the Lord. Step back and look at it. Lord, you got this worked out. Help me to see it. Right? Don't look in the natural, but look to him. He's a great God and a great provider. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me all over the room? I'm going to pray over the offering and bless it. Would everybody take an offering envelope and place it in your hand? Everyone stand if you're able to stand. Amen. Honor God and thank him today. Hallelujah. God, I want to thank you. I want to thank you that our church is a missions-giving church. I want to thank you that people today... As simple as it is, they heard, oh, they're going to be giving clothes and stuff to people in need outside the walls. And Lord, we rally together as a church to fulfill every commitment and seize every opportunity that comes across our path to do great things in your kingdom. And Lord, you've been so kind to the Bridge Church, Lord. You've supplied all her needs. Lord, you've already got it worked out. We bless this offering, both the gift and the giver, and everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give today. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Woo, woo, there it is.
is. Okay, here we go. I was just entertaining myself. Are you ready to declare? All right, everybody, hold it up. Let's mean it. Say it like we mean it. Here we go. <coughs> Faith Declaration of Kingdom Finances. As we obey and give the Lord's tithes and offerings, we believe the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises, bonuses, and benefits, sales and commissions, settlements, estates, and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, gifts, debts demolished, and royalties received. Heavenly Father, we thank you that every chair here is filled with a person. We seek to be a debt-free church and a debt-free people, and we declare this by faith in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. amen. So be that. That's awesome. All right. So, guys, this is awesome today because, number one, this is the day the Lord has made. Number two, we want to thank Miss Vonnie and Miss Carla for doing a great job last week in Kids Church. Nothing was said because, quite frankly, I forgot to say something and didn't know, but wow, they were awesome. And this week, we're super happy that Dr. Tom and Susan are back. And so if you are one of my favorite people on the planet and you are one of those people who are going to Bridge Church right now, Brid's kids, did I say that? I said that wrong. I totally said that wrong. Get used to it. Bridge youth also, we got to get another slide. So if you are now a teenager type person and you go to Bridge youth, it's the youth. I'm trying to say that like I'm from the north, but it doesn't work because I am not. All right, Pastor, I'm going to just turn it over to you now. Well, thank you, You're Kelly. Welcome. I appreciate that. I'll be quiet. Amen. Let's clap for these kids. Amen. <laughs> Lord bless the next generation. Yes. How many of you understand? Unless we teach and train the next generation, they will not know the things of God. Right. Amen. It should go without saying <clears throat> that we could look back in the Old Testament at the nation of Israel. And along the timeline of the different generations, they were challenged at times with sin and committing sin and not living a righteous life. Even to the point that I believe it's not God's will, but God allows according to what we do, right? I don't believe God wants any of us to be in slavery. Amen. I don't believe that. That's not the way of the, of the character of God. But when we walk away, when God has this for you and you walk off from it, and you take another trail, sometimes there are detours and they can turn into being good things, right? I left uh, New Orleans Friday morning coming back home and uh, there's this little town <clears throat> and it's on a U.S. highway and I was on Interstate 10 and the Holy Spirit, I just said, which way should I go? I mean, there are lots of ways I know how to go. And, you know, and I just felt like I need to go this, through this town called Crot Springs. And it's kind of like a detour because you're on a U.S. highway instead of on the interstate. And I forgot about it. Well, after I crossed the Chafalaya Basin uh, and came down off of it, boom, there was a car accident up ahead and traffic was backed up for miles. So I got to see the swamp a little bit at a time. And the, 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 the average was probably two miles an hour. But thank God for those bursts of five miles an hour, right? Felt like you were going to go somewhere. Three lanes of traffic reduced down to one lane. And everybody was waiting on everybody. Amen? I wonder why, and I ask God, because we talk pretty often and pretty close. Does that make sense? And, and I said, Lord... Why did I forget, you know? And I always have this attitude about traveling. It's a good principle to have. If the Lord tells you a certain way, try, go that way. But if you forget it, his grace, he understands you forget, right? And, uh, but I look at accidents where if that happens, I'm there for a purpose, right? I've helped people before, right? And I've also it changed the, the itinerary before, and it's also changed the timeline where when we come into a situation, God may be using that to protect us. Yes. 
There may be someone else in that group that he has protected, and I get to be along the ride with them. Back to the nation of Israel, when we go to the New Testament, we see time, I mean the Old Testament, we see time and time again the nature of humans personified in the history of the nation of Israel, where they would follow God and do great things, and then sometimes as a nation, they did not follow God as well as they should. God told Israel that he did not want her to have a king, but because of their relentless requests, God allowed them to have a king. God had a better way, and that was to speak to the prophets and release it through the house of God, okay? And the priests release information to the people. But like other nations who had kings, God allowed them to have a king. It did not always work out well for them, right? Many of the leaders in Israel that led the nation of Israel, uh, they were in civil discourse when the north, northern and the southern kingdom divided. We see many of these things going on in our nation today. I will testify that I believe with all of my heart the greatest place to live in the world is in the United States of America. Yes. I've been a few places. I've not been all over the world, but I believe that. And although it's not on this continent, Hawaii's included in there, okay? So if it gets really bad, go to the beach, right? That's, that's Carla's philosophy. I need to take, she's not in here. She went to, to the bank, but I need to do that. Y'all remind me of that. Take her to the beach. And as I look at our nation today, I've titled this message, Let's Make America Great Again. Now, obviously, the last four words of that, and some of you aren't going to be happy when I say this, were an old slogan adopted by former President Trump when he ran for president to lead the United States. Many people had never heard that slogan. In this generation, it meant nothing to them other than what he made it be. My Bible teaches me that whoever gets elected, whether it's good, bad, or evil, it's not my responsibility. I still have to bring my life before God, and I still have to honor authority, and my job is to pray and preach the Word of God. Amen. Our nation in about the last 70 to 80 years, if you will, has gone through cataclysmic change it is one thing has caused another that's what cataclysmic means one thing has caused another thing to change I believe there's some factors for this especially in the last 30 years or so and that is the fact uh, personal computers were invented Computers weren't from being depending on the need. They had rooms larger than this that held computers to operate them. And now my first computer would not match anywhere close to my personal cell phone that's in my hand. This is probably 50 to 100 times better and faster other than the size of the screen, right? And I just have to deal with that. Amen? We have seen changes happen in our nation, uh, with our states, and with our nation across the board. And it's just like when we seem that we're going to settle and get on a track to go forward again, something else comes to bring challenge to us that does not keep us on the God track. Can I just go ahead and say this, and you can heal the rest of the service if this applies to you? Are you ready to receive? Yep. I say this because I love you as a pastor, but a great part of why America is where she is today is the church is selling goods that don't need to be sold to the godly people in the church are to bring souls into the kingdom of God. 
We have churches that are country clubs. They're social places. And I'm glad fellowship is a great need. We have another movie night at the end of the month. Come on. I'd, I'd threaten to cook for you, but I don't know if I can, right? It, uh, where we could just eat together and watch a movie together, right? We had a lot of fun at the last one. It's a great movie, too. And, uh, yeah, I was thinking about that, but I'm not going to promise what I may not can commit. That's what I was thinking. It, uh, so, I have a lot of information, and I'm just going to probably say I'm not going to finish everything today, but next Sunday is communion, and I'm trying to be disciplined to somewhat shorten the message and lead into communion. Next Sunday, we're going to receive communion and concentrate on 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people. And we're going to ask the Lord to cleanse our nation. We're going to receive communion and do that. Let's make America great again. I want to say to you, because I'm going to shift here in a moment, that if the church will really sell out to the Lord and we preach an uncompromised Bible, amen? Yep. We get the mixture out of the church. It would present something to people. There are people that are looking for Christ. God made us that way. Come on, somebody. That's in your nature as a human being to fill that God-sized hole in your life. And God is ready but if we would come back and serve the Lord with everything we've got, God could turn our nation around. Amen. Yep. Yeah. But if the church does not rise up in this hour, God help us is the cry of this pastor. Because this land we call the home of the free and of the brave, you're going to need some bravery to live here because the freedoms won't be what we've experienced. Now, I'm saying that prophetically. Obviously, I see some things, but I believe it to be the truth of my heart. God is working, bringing conviction in the house of God and among Christian people to bring them back to righteousness. You say, well, our nation's not in slavery. Yes, we are. We are enslaved everywhere you turn in the church and in our nation. God heal our land. Amen? Amen? I would like to read one verse to open today. I may refer to some others. and We'll see how far we can get with the Lord's help. Amen? Amen? Psalm, the 33rd Psalm, verse 12. <clears throat> Blessed is the nation. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I'm going to read that part again. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen? Amen? And if this nation can find God again, it won't be answered by slickness in the church, by politics. Whoever sits on the throne of this nation that's leading, it won't be done in the president's office. Amen? I'd love to see a president that that cooperates with God's agenda in the earth. Amen? Yes. Right? But no man can do everything that needs to be done in our nation. We need a move of God. Amen. Money's not going to fix our nation. People scream about the economy, but I see them eating out. I see them at the gas pump. and looks to me like, including me, we've gained a few pounds. So it's not the economy that's destroying us. Come on now. It's the truth. It's our lack of chasing after our God. Yes. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. After Christ are we. Once we come to Christ, we are God's people in the earth. He is my daddy God, amen? amen. And he has great big hands. And it amazes that when you come up on something, God always, when you're after him, he's always got it worked out for you. Let's get started. Got that out of my heart, amen. This is a very different message that I preach. 
or share. We have a lot of history today that we're going to be involved in going back to the founding fathers and how our nation began. Um, so a lot of it I have to read because the, I don't deal with this information every day, but a, I just can't spurt it out of my head, okay? At this moment, I can't. The Lord blesses me. I'll be ready to do that anytime. If we listen long enough to organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union or the Freedom From Religion Foundation or almost any other liberal organization, you will come to believe their version of American history. Not in my notes, but might I add, we have a young generation, and I'm talking about people 40 years, maybe 50 years old and younger. At 64, that looks young to me. But I'm telling you, those generations, especially in our younger generations, but even to our young adults that have families, the truth of God's word needs to be magnified in the understanding of who we are and what our assignment is as a nation in the earth needs to be refound. If you believed one of these liberal organizations and you kept listening to them and you were never told the truth or exposed to it, you would come to believe that America was founded by a wide diversity of people from many different faiths. Some of them would be deist, some atheist, and a few Christians. Although they were each different in their beliefs, they were all united with one dream. They wanted to build a completely secular nation that was devoid of any religious influence, especially Christian influence. Now, that's what the liberal organizations in our nation today want you to think and believe. And let me tell you, they have the minds of our college students for several classes of them for years. I would say back to 10 to 20 years ago, this doctrine of secularism was being taught in our schools, and now it's being taught in our local schools. Nothing that God cannot return on and make better, but unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Their goal was to build an unscalable wall all around the United States, a philosophical wall, if you would, that this country would protect it from any, would be protected from any religious influence seeping into public life. That version of the American history belongs in the same category as the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. It is a complete myth. It is not truth. And it is a lie. I hope that you, I'm going to take a pause and talk to you for a second. I didn't say this in the beginning. I didn't write it down. But I believe whether you are going to be a parent, you are a parent, yes. or you're, you as a parent have children, you may have generations to great, great grandkids you need to listen and share. You need to say something and speak into their world to make sure that the Bible that they are getting from wherever they are being taught the word of God is God's word in its fullness and not just enough to give them some type of Christianity that rescues them in eternal life and they don't burn in hell or it rescues them that I'm going to give God like a tip from my life and show up and do my thing on Sunday morning, and then I go back into the world and live in the world like the world in that culture. Yes. God, more than ever before, needs a church that will stand up and be counted for. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Say that. I did. What we are going to discover today is America was founded by predominantly, but not exclusively, by Christians, men who wanted to build the foundation of this Christian nation on God's will. They believed our future success as a nation depended on our fidelity. Isn't that an old word? It's what we commit to when we do a ring ceremony in marriage. 
Our, my, the, the faithfulness, the fidelity, the purity of my marriage when I put this ring on as I make a covenant with God and my wife that it's me and her. There's no other woman in the world for me. And we need a church in this nation that is so committed to God. There's no other God but Jesus Christ, Amen. Father God. Amen? Yes. They wanted to build that nation, and they shaped our nation in the beginning. It depended on our fidelity, our faithfulness to Christian beliefs. Yes. That is why we say without hesitation or apology, America was founded as a Christian nation. I don't care what they spout on the TV. I don't care what level of leadership they are in our land, but that is a myth. When you can look back in history and there are events recorded and what people said and what they did, where they were when they said it, and you can go back and read it and find it, you'll find this propaganda is a lie. Yes. The first thing I'd like us to look at today <coughs> are the spiritual belief system of our founders. What were their spiritual beliefs? Were they neutral toward Christ? Does some believe and will tell you so? No. In fact, 52 of the 55 men at the Constitutional Convention were Orthodox Christians. I would say that's a majority. And our government in this land, this great land that we celebrate, and other than celebrating the birth and resurrection of Jesus, the third most important thing we should be celebrating is God gave the world a picture of what government in the earth looks like. No matter how far we as a nation have strayed from that truth of our founding fathers, it's still going to be true. In fact, two of our founders, Elias, this is a French guy, Boudinot, and John Jay, who went on to be the first Supreme Justice of our Supreme Court. That's John Jay. I'm going to talk about him several times. Supreme Court Justice over the whole nation went on to be the leaders of the American Bible Society. That's how much they believed in God's Word. And I don't you can go look that up on the internet. I don't want to give them a commercial because I don't have time. They wanted, listen closely, to distribute the Bible to as many people as possible. They believed the message of the Bible could transform lives and set the nation on a proper moral course. I believe that with all of my heart. When people are converted and they are taught the word of God and they hear the word, obey the word, and they grow in Christ, step by step, moment by moment, and get closer to God, we mature in the things of God. Amen? Yes, it is true that two of our founders were deists. And I'm going to quote both of them, maybe today, maybe next Sunday, to let you see and understand, although they were not Christians, somebody write that down, a deist is not a Christian. Please write that down. You need to know that. Everybody gets on Facebook a little bit, and I was flipping through, and there was this ad about deism. And when I looked down, two of my friends had liked that. I wanted to contact them, and God reminded me, if I need you to correct, I could call their names. It's still This is a, several months ago it bothered me so much. I'm talking about godly men. I'm talking about men who are in church and serving leadership, Right? They had checked off that they liked this ad about deism, and I didn't go dig in it. It might have been something good if I'd have read it. Come on, somebody. How many times did you check off on something you didn't really read about? God forgive us all. Amen. All right, I'll get back to preaching. It is true that two of our founders were deists, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, and yet, even these deists could not ignore the spiritual foundation of this country. It is interesting that both of these men worked together to form a national seal for this newly formed nation called the United, what we call today the United States of America. Are you aware of what the seal looked like? Anybody? I wasn't until I studied about it. Get this. 
It was a drawing of Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. Come on, they had been, God led them out of England and into this new land they were in, following God and the pillar of the cloud as our national symbol. Wow! Come on, somebody. Yes, amen. <clears throat> Benjamin Franklin believed the Continental Congress should seek God's blessing in an opening prayer every time they met. A deist presented that when they were forming our government. Here's a quote. I hope I have it up there. Yes. Sorry, these quotes, some of them are long. <coughs> and um, there's small fonts up there, but I have it right here. I hope I can read it right. This is from Benjamin Franklin, the deist, who also believed in the gospel, okay? He said, I have lived a long time, sir, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God <laughs> governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, that's in Matthew and Luke, right? Is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? If God has to feed the sparrow, don't you think he needs to feed us? That's my words. We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord build, rebuild, and build, and rebuild the United States, we are just fooling ourselves in our building process. If I could say one thing to our church is we've got to fast and pray and seek the Lord about who we vote for. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, a Libertarian. If you're a Christian, you need to know God, know his will of what we need so that we can turn our nation back on the course God has for it. Some years ago, there were two professors from the University of Houston, Charles, Houston, Charles Lineman and Donald Luntz. They did a study to find out who our founding fathers quoted the most. They believed that they could find out who they quoted the most so we could better understand the founders' documents. I believe that to be true. They studied for over 10 years, researching some 15,000 documents and here are their conclusions. Are you ready? The three sources the fathers quoted the most are a British philosopher, John Locke, a French philosopher, Baron Montesquieu, and an English judge, Sir William Blackstone. That was the, those three people they quoted the most. However, thank God for howevers, our founding fathers cited the Bible Four times more than Mont Mont Montesquieu and Blackstone, four times more, and 12 times more they, than they quoted John Locke. In fact, more than one-third of all the founding fathers' quotes came directly from the Bible. Praise the Lord, somebody. Go ahead. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The other, one-third is 33, right, percent. The other 60% of quotes, of their quotes, were from authors who based their books and their writings on, the, on, on, the, on writings from the Bible. So if you put 33 and 60 together, you have 93% of the founder's quotes had a connection to the Word of God. In fact, the Founding Fathers referenced more from the Bible than all other Enlightenment authors combined. Praise the Lord. It is this historical fact caused by Kent Woodford of Newsweek magazine. This is a modern article. He studied this study and he wrote an article titled, How the Bible Made America... And he used this study done in the University of Houston. In this article, and I quote, he says, Now historians are discovering that the Bible, even perhaps more than the Constitution, 
is our founding document. Somebody say amen. 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 I would have to believe that to be true once someone studies it out and gets the answers. The second thing that I'd like to talk about this morning is the words of our founding fathers. Not only do we see them in history, but they actually say things that makes an impact in our world today. We all know that George Washington is the first president of the United States of what we call the USA today. <coughs> in his inaugural address as president, this is what he said. I hope I have it up there. Yay, you can follow along. It would be peculiarly improper to omit in this first official act my fervent supplications to that almighty being. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Who is he talking about? He was talking about Father God. That in the beginning, God moved on people's hearts to come here and establish a nation to honor the Lord. Amen? What a great quote. First president, inaugural address, he gives all the glory to God. And I like the part where he talked about fervent supplications. They were not only a people of the Bible, but they were a people of prayer. And before this message is over, they were also a people who went to church. Many of our founders, matter of fact, all of them attended church, depending on where they lived and what they did as the nation grew. This is from John Adams, our second president. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Whoa. Did you hear that? Yeah. Not anything else. Christianity. And he says, I will avow that, as I then believed, and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. Immutability talk is a characteristic of God. He changes not. So therefore, we have built this nation on the immutable God that we serve and the principles come from his word, our foundation is secure. It was built right. We just need a remodel job on the house. And that those principles of liberty, freedom, are as offerable as human nature. The very fact that humanity is born and breathes in this nation, it is a breath that is controlled by the freedom that God has given us. He goes on to say, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Do I need to stop there? Our, this is John Adams. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. In less than 75 years, we have gotten away from that right there. Now, there's always, there's always sin and immorality in every culture and generation since Adam and Eve. Yeah. You go look in the book of uh, Genesis, no sooner than Adam and Eve got married, God put them together, knit their hearts together <coughs> to have a family. They have sons and one son kills the other one. That's sin. That's immorality. Hello. It's against the plan of God for us to kill one another. Help us, Jesus. In New Orleans, they have at least one murder a day. It was the news was a topic every day. Who, who, who got murdered, right? Seriously. Baton Rouge, since much of New Orleans moved there in 05, 2005, after Katrina, is an average of three murders a day in Baton Rouge. Wow. Wow. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. What was founded in our nation 
will not help lead people who are immoral and against God. Only God can fix that. Amen? When our nation, <coughs> excuse me, when our nation turns to secularism and away from God, we have no document that can keep order in our country. Our forefathers designed this country and wrote the Constitution with the assumption that people would be guided by belief in and obedience to God. That's, in the, that's my words applying to the quotes that I'm reading you. Here's another one from the son of John Adams. His name is John Jay. He's the first. I talked about him earlier. Uh, first Supreme Court Justice and co-author to the Federalist Papers. This is what he says. Providence, this is how they refer to God. Providence has given our people the choice of their rulers. Are you catching on to this? When Israel had a king, how did they get their rulers? The strongest one, whether they were godly or evil. Whoever had the best army and could fight the best overtook the other ones, and you became a slave to a new culture. We see that in our history books. It's taught in our schools. I hope it is. Maybe we need to go back to school as adults and listen in, right? I'm going to read this again. I want you to grab hold of it. Providence has given our people the choice of their rulers, and that's not the end of the quote. This is what he says about our responsibility. It is the duty as well as the privilege of our Christian nation to elect and prefer Christians as their rulers. We in America have made a joke out of the voting system that was created on a foundation of God's word that gives justice for everyone in our nation, gives protection, gives leadership, but it hinges on one thing. There are people that say, man, our politics is so bad. I don't, Christian people and others, I don't even think I can vote in this next election. Are you here this morning? We've made a joke of the system that we're supposed to seek the face of God, get a word from God, and obey it in the voting booth. God help us. God help us. We have a duty to prefer and elect Christian leaders in our country at all levels. I know there are some Christians being elected today. I, none of us are a judge of any other Christian, right? And it is difficult to find out what people truly believe when they say that they're even a pastor anymore or they go to church anymore. That means something different to everybody, not what it meant to our founders when we started this nation. They went to church. They sought God. Amen. Let me finish up. John Jay, he just said that. Let's go to John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams and the sixth president of the United States. Hang on. <clears throat> He said this, why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and venerated festival returns this day, July 4th? It is not that in the chain of human events that the birthday of the nation is undecidedly linked to the birthday of the Savior. Is it not that the Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon the earth? It's based on the gospel. They, they, these people put, gave up in England everything they had. Many of them left their families there in hopes of one day reunited. And they went by the leadership of the Holy Spirit to go and find a place, to go and find a place 
to build a nation that's based on God's mission in the earth. He continues, that it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity, the resurrection, ascension, the spirit outpouring, the building of the church. He says this, the highest, the transcendent glory of the American Revolution was this, that it connected in one indissoluble bond, can't wash it away, can't tear it apart, the principles of civil government and the precepts of Christianity. They are welded together in our foundation. If it has never been considered in that light, it is because its compass has not been perceived. Folks, we as Christians today have a great heritage being born in this great nation. Amen? Amen. But as citizens and as Christians, we have a great responsibility to know the truth and to get our nation back on track. Any train that runs off track causes destruction. Somebody's going to get hurt somewhere, right? Right? Something bad is going to happen, even if it's the chemicals like up in uh, Pennsylvania when the train crashed earlier this year, I believe it was. Yeah, it was. It was last, last spring. Dakota, my son, was traveling back from New York State. He'd been there for an interview, and he wanted to go through Pennsylvania, and he was in the area where that crash happened. The chemicals that were let in the atmosphere were harmful to people and animals and fish. I don't care what the paper says. Come on, somebody. Yeah. It's like they think we don't have good common sense, right? All right. It's 1115. You think we can... Let me look. Yeah. Ooh, Jesus. All right, we're going to try it, okay? I'll try to finish by 1130. Is that okay? If someone were listening to me this morning, it is very likely... And they would most likely be a younger person with this thought in their mind. They would want to ask me the question or stand up and wave at me and ask me, Pastor, what about the separation of church and state? It's in our Constitution. No, it's not. Don't steal my thunder. Amen. (laughs) The separation of church and state is nowhere in our government documents. Nowhere. It does not exist. It does exist in a letter written by a president. We'll talk about that. My simple answer to anyone that says, well, you know, we've got separation of church and state, but there's no such thing as that. And most of you likely reply, why would you say such a thing, Pastor? It's in our Constitution. No, it's not. Not anywhere. So, I have a question for you. I think it's a question. If it says so, it probably is a question, right? If the phrase separation of church and state is not in the Constitution, where did it come from? Truth will make you free. Actually, you have to look outside of any government document to find the first time it is written. And let's look at the writing of President Thomas Jefferson. The first time that phrase was used was a letter between President Thomas Jefferson and a group of Baptists from Danbury, Connecticut. In 1801, remember that date. I'm not going to give you a test, and it's hard for me to remember dates, but there are a couple things that are going to play into this time, and we need to understand, okay? In 1801, it would have been nine years after the ratification of the First Amendment. Does anybody know what the First Amendment is? Well, it's the freedom of religion, actually, okay? In 1801, most states still had, listen closely, state-sponsored churches. These were godly people that originally built our nation. It was very, I'm sure there were some sinners in the group or some, none of them were perfect Christians. Let's be real. They were people. 
But when they went and they built a town, they would build, they would build one church so the community could come together to worship together. You with me? Does that make sense? Now, later on, and <coughs> I read this, but I don't think it's in my notes. I may pick it up next week. Later on, you hear reports like in larger populated areas, instead of having one church, they've got multiple churches and multiple denominations of people that are worshiping. But listen to what it said, state-sponsored. That meant when the people paid taxes to operate the government, one of the things that they did with that money is go back and help establish towns, colonies, and people. And that included the beginning of a church there and the operational cost. Actually, there were people selected by the government that would go to these churches to pastor. It was very common, all right? I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I may not pick it up next week. Okay, what is a state-sponsored church? I just answered that. So in Danbury, Connecticut, there's a group of Baptists that they are not the state-sponsored church, but they are in existence And in Danbury, the population must have grown, and we had what was called the Congregational Church was what they would build. Why did they call it the Congregational Church? It's just my opinion. Because we come together as a congregation no matter what our divided beliefs are. We can all worship together at the foot of the cross, and the first building the state's going to build, it's for everybody. Come on, somebody, right? Right? And so they called it, we're a congregation in this city. We all come together to worship together and worship God and serve him together, right? And that attitude was in every town that they built, okay? So the Baptists are having problems, okay? So every year the Baptists would petition the state asking for the funds to be redirected to them for their church support because In the writings of the law, it said, we build these churches and we support and operate them. It was the government's job to do that, right? But now we've got a new church. It's got pastor there, and it's a different group of people. And they had to petition their state and say, hey, we're out here too. We're a new church. Can you send us our money to operate and make sure we're taken care of? And they would do that every year, okay? It was being done. So every year, the the, the Baptists did this. Uh, But it was a hassle to do this. So the date I gave you a minute ago was 1801. That was nine years. 1802, January 1, New Year's Day. President Jefferson wrote this letter to the Danbury Baptist. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people. He says, I'm not just looking at what you need but I'm looking at how our nation was founded and I want to be pure in what I decide and do, which declared that their legislature should, and he quotes the First Amendment, make no law affecting an establishment of religion prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. Then he continues on, thus building a wall of separation between the church and state. That is the first time that it was ever written, ever said, And it was done so by the president of the United States in telling them, your needs are being met. You're getting the money you need. Therefore, we're not going to go back and change a law that is on our books that is serving you well. We believe the government is here to take care of the people, and that includes church. So we're going to make sure you've got a church to go to. Come on, somebody. Woo, get me started. Amen? All right. President Jefferson is quoting the Constitution, the First Amendment. The context of the letter is that one denomination will not be preferred over another. Uh, He is reminding the Danbury Baptists where they came from, England, the nation they left to find a place to have freedom of religion. These people were searching for a place to build a nation that would never keep anyone from worshiping they wanted the way they wanted to worship. That You already had that freedom to worship any way you wanted to. All right, I'm going to move quick. Put your, put, your, put your seatbelt on, all right? 
How do we know this? By the writings and the words of the founders. Because one year later, okay, this was 1802 that that quote was made. But one year after uh, he wrote that letter, okay, one year, he signed a bill to support a minister to go to the Kaskaskia Indians, Indians to start a missions outreach. The government was doing missions. That's why they came to America. It's to spread the gospel. And the government paid for this missions outreach that was being built. On January 3, this is two days after January 1, President Jefferson wrote the letter to the Danbury Baptist. He had that two days later, two days after he wrote that letter, he attended a worship service in the Capitol building. In Washington, D.C., that was the first place they had church, and they had church in our nation's capital for decades and decades and decades. It was a big enough building that they could all meet there together. And uh, if you visit the Capitol, there is a, a, I haven't been there, people told me this, you can go there and there's a document where he, the president, attended on this date and it's, he signed, because when you came to church, you signed in to let the pastor know you were there. Mm. Woo, imagine that. The founders always believed in religious freedom. The First Amendment in the, is in the Constitution to protect religious freedom. The founders never believed the First Amendment was to stop prayer in school. Somebody in this room today. Or prevent a nativity scene to be put up in a, in, on Main Street in a community. Or out in front of a church. Yeah. Or make a courthouse or move the Ten Commandments off the wall. That was never the intent of the founding fathers. The early court rulings show us that the government was not only established by Christian principles, but also it shows how Christianity served their everyday life. This is a case, this is a court case, law. It's the case of Rumpel versus Weinmiller in 1799, okay, right? This is before the 1801-1802, right? I'm just putting it in time for you. Okay, seven years after the First Amendment was ratified into law, okay? In 1799, the Supreme Court of Maryland decided our form of government supports the Christian religion as the established religion seven years, seven years after that law, this man quotes it in court. The First Amendment was about protecting religious expression, not about being oppressive to churches or Christians. Amen. Here's a case for you. and we'll, I believe this is the last one. Let me get another sip here. <coughs> The case of Nadal versus Gerard's executors. This is really cool. It was a very complicated case, but I'm going to give you the overview of it after I read it and studied about it. A very wealthy man died in Philadelphia and left his money to establish a school. They called them colleges, a school for orphans. They were called colleges. Had one stipulation. No Christian minister could teach in the school he was funding. So, uh, the executors were sued. Uh, it's called the case of Nadal versus the executors who are trying to carry out the will. They sued, okay? <coughs> they, uh, the people in Pennsylvania wanted this reversed so the Bible and Christianity be, could be taught, thus continuing the tradition of our nation being fully built on Bible principles. The Supreme Court ended up siding with the will of the deceased man. The fact that you do not have a minister teaching in the school does not stop Christianity from being taught in school. Hey, somebody say amen. amen. So here is the decision. Why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, without note or comment, be read and taught as a divine revelation in the college? They said it's so powerful you can just read it to them. Come on, somebody. Yeah. It's general precepts expounded. It's evidences explained. And it's glorious principles of morality inculcated. In other words, you can't stop the word of God. Mm -hmm. Just reading it would change people's lives. Yes. Somebody in the court system, that judge, 
The people who made that decision, they made a decision for God, his word. The court had something to say about those who would say you have to treat all religions the same. So the ruling continues. So they wrote this. It is unnecessary for us, however, to consider what the legal effect of such a device in Pennsylvania for the establishment of a school or college, for the propagation of Judaism or deism or any other form of infidelity. Such a case is not presumed to be in a Christian country. Non-Christian teaching on religion is not, by the courts, is not allowed. Our courts did not hesitate to say our country's a Christian nation. Did y'all get that? I'm reading from someone who lived then, right? The justice who delivered the decision of the court was a man named Joseph Story. He was appointed to the Supreme Court in 1811 by President James Madison. Madison was considered to be the architect of the Constitution. Later, Joseph Story wrote an entire commentary on the on the Constitution. It has been used in law schools all over our country since. Lawyers have to study this document to get law right. In his notes, this is what Joseph Story said. The purpose of the founders in the First Amendment was to put all Christian denominations on the same level to keep one Christian denomination from being elevated above the other. But our founders never meant for Christianity to be subservient to other religions of the world. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close with this. And it is 1129. I'd like to read Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 through 16 to you. Maybe just 13. I didn't change that part. This is what Matthew wrote in his gospel in the Beatitudes. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. As a nation, we've let our salt get wet. It no longer flavors and seasons But God has the ability to help us to be salt. He goes on to talk about light, but we're going to save that next week. We're going to talk about salt today. The church is supposed to be salt and light. Christians are supposed to be salt and light. When this nation started, it was based on people who went to church. They believed the word of God, and they believed they were here to build a Christian nation that would serve the kingdom of God to all of eternity. If you take Christianity out of a society, that society will destroy itself and evil will engulf the world. What does salt do? It purifies, salt preserves, salt decontaminates, salt also stings and irritates. But yet we have a church today that our salt is worthless. We are the salt of the earth, the word of God says to, and we need to be more salty than we've ever been before. And we don't have to put, make salt where it ruins a meal. How many of you know if you put too much, it's not any good? It's a fine balance of just the right amount depending on the situation. If you're going to eat taters or rice, you need a little more salt for that gravy, right? Come on. What does salt do? We are the salt of the earth. And when the salt is taken out, the moral rot will destroy a nation. And may I kindly say to you that that's what's going on in this great country. Our immorality is destroying us. And we're whistling, riding along, skipping down a trail, going with it, acting like we are oblivious to what's happening around us, where our rights as Christians are being trampled upon and we let it go. We started with a verse. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, Mm -hmm. the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Mm -hmm. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father God, thank you for the truth. I pray, Lord, that we would note this message and when we need to use it, we can send a link to people that would, they could go and find this message on YouTube. Just by clicking on a a link, they can listen to the truth that I've shared today. For the naysayer, I would say, 
I'm being very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. For the one that would listen to this and say, I thought he needed to preach the gospel. I've preached more Bible than what you probably heard today anyway, but that's okay. We need to know the truth of the history of who we are. My daddy would say to me, I said this to Dakota when he was coming up. He'd get out of line a little bit. I'd look at him and say, what's your name? He'd say, Dakota. I said, what's your last name? Smith. I said, what does that make you? I'm one of the Smith boys. I said, what does that mean? It means my behavior has a reflection on you, Dad. Father, our behavior has a reflection on you. And we repent for having a dirty mirror instead of letting the light of the gospel shine in and through us. We've dimmed our light. Our salt is not salty. Lord, we repent. We ask you to cleanse us and forgive us and give us the wisdom we need how to carry the salt of your word with us everywhere you go. Everywhere we step, that as we come across people, we can salt the conversation gently lovingly kindly just like Jesus wisely did thank you Lord I'm asking you to help this church be salt in this earth help us Lord thank you Jesus amen would you stand all over this building praise the Lord if you need prayers, we close this morning. When I close, you're welcome to come up here and we'll pray for you, minister to you. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I'm asking you to bless the Bridge Church, Lord, all the ministries that come out of this house, outside the walls, all of our missions efforts, Lord, all of our leadership training, all the people that are learning about your word, Lord, we need your help. <laughs> Ooh, you're a mighty God, and we bless you, Lord. Bless your people today. Lord, use the truth from this word today. Use the truth to motivate us to help the generations behind us, to help them see, know, hear, and obey, and do. Thank you, God. We bless you, Lord. God bless you for being here today. Online church you need anything, our number's posted there on the screen, 479-522-0172. Uh, I had to think about that, didn't I? Praise God. Don't call myself, right? Amen. God bless you today. If you need prayer, we're going to dismiss. But if you need prayer, come on up here, and we'll, uh, we'll minister to you, okay?